So, I see you like Dark Souls. I also see that you like anime. Well, look no further because this game's got you covered on both bases. Or does it? Welcome back everyone, Vamayobra here and in today's video we'll be reviewing Code Vein and figuring out is it worth playing in 2023? As always, we'll be dividing things into three parts. Story, gameplay, and replayability. At the end of the video, if you guys have anything to add to the review or just want to share your thoughts, please do so in the comment section below and let's talk about it. Now sit back, grab a snack, and let's jump right into the video. Code Vein is a third-person action RPG game set in a post-apocalyptic dystopian world where humanity is in danger. And the only ones that can stop the threat are individuals called Revenants which are basically dead people who were brought back to life for the purpose of fighting the monsters in the game. All that to be explained later. It was developed and published by Bandai Namco Entertainment for PS4, Xbox One, and Windows on September 27, 2019, and takes heavy inspiration from games like Dark Souls and God Eater. Now if you've played both the games Code Vein takes inspiration from, then you probably already know what you're getting into. But before you go ahead and satisfy your anime souls fantasy, let's talk about a few things, starting with the story. The story starts with the main character, that's you, waking up in a wrecked metropolis area with a mysterious woman watching over you while you were asleep or dead. Both of you don't seem to remember anything, but near your location is a pale looking tree. As you get closer to it, your character starts to feel pain and remember memories of what seemed to be a past life. Mysterious woman then proceeds to bite your arm. Yeah, I was confused too. And your blood drops on the roots of the pale tree. This causes the tree to suddenly burst with growth and produce little blood drop looking things called blood beads. You take a blood bead and it seemingly eases the pain. Not long after, a random group of revenants find you, basically kidnap you, and force you to find more of those blood beads you just made earlier. Apparently, revenants need these blood beads to prevent them from going into a frenzy. When they frenzy, they become the lost. You can compare this to something like in Dark Souls, where in the lore, if you die too much or lose sight of your goal as an undead, you turn hollow. Except here in Code Vein, every time you die, you lose memories of the times when you were still human. This has no gameplay implication whatsoever though. Another thing to note is that revenants need to wear masks because of a red miasma that's present in the area. Without the masks, they turn into the lost instantly. Again, no huge gameplay implication here. As you explore the underground of the city, you come across this stranger who offers help. When you finally arrive at the surface, both you and the stranger fight against a recently frenzied acquaintance. After the fight, the boss drops something called a vestige, which is a crystal filled with the memories of the person it belonged to. Normally, a revenant who touches these are consumed by it and turned into the lost, but if you haven't noticed it by now, you're special. Not only can you cause those pale trees to make blood beads with your blood, you can also overcome these vestiges and explore the memories contained within. This has massive story implications, but this also gives you the abilities that person possessed. More on this on the gameplay section. From here, you join the stranger back to their hideout where you meet the main cast. The story then revolves around finding the solution to the problem, which is the scarcity of blood beads. Along the path, you not only discover your own personal story, but the backstories of all the cast members as well, which tie together with the main plot. Voice acting can be a hit or miss. I played the game in the English language, but I wish there was a way to play the game English subbed rather than dubbed. That would have made the storytelling more genuine, at least for me. Small update as I'm recording this, I just figured out that there is an option for Japanese spoken language, but it's only accessible in the title screen, so there's that. I'll leave the rest of the story discovering to you, but let's just say it takes a very anime approach to the storytelling. Cutscenes and finding vestiges are the main way the game tells a story, and while sometimes I think the vestiges can get too time-consuming and boring, 
the cutscenes offer a refreshing break from the gameplay loop. That's about all you need to know with the story to get you going. Anything after that would be too much of a spoiler for you, but I think you can guess where this game is headed with its heavy inspiration to Dark Souls. The introduction may seem to be overwhelming and nothing really makes sense, but stick with it for a while and you'll start to see a somewhat solid story come through. Now let's move on to the gameplay section. I have a lot to say regarding the gameplay, so hear me out on this. Being heavily inspired by Dark Souls and God Eater, the gameplay is reminiscent of those games. First, the tutorial. The tutorial is a separate segment of the game related to the story. Your character underwent the tutorial while they were knocked out prior to waking up in the first cutscene. It was a dream. This might just be personal preference since I've played the Souls games prior to this, but I would have appreciated it more if they integrated the tutorial into the starting level of the game. The tutorial also throws a lot at you, most of which I didn't really understand at first. It was an information overload. Heck, even the game says that all the information is sudden. Fortunately, the game allows you to read back on the mechanics in a menu screen anytime in-game. Second, the UI. To me, the menu screen for skills, items, equipment, and blood codes felt off. Not necessarily cluttered, but it did take some time to get used to. Especially since the icons used for these slots are so unique and by the time you first see this screen, you know close to nothing about the game. You get to bring a total of 2 weapons, 1 blood veil, which is your armor, 4 passive skills, 8 active skills, several items in your quick slot bar, and your blood code, which is your class, at any given time. As commonly seen in Souls Likes, there are several weapons and item types, each having their own stats and movesets. The weapons you bring and the class you equip will mostly govern how your character plays in the game. You can change your class anytime in the game, and these blood codes define the stats you have. You have the basic fighter, hunter, and mage classes to choose from in the beginning, but trust me when I say, there are a lot of classes in this game. Each class also has a set of skills that are unique to that class. You can master these skills by defeating enemies while equipped or by spending resources. Mastering the skill allows you to use it regardless of which class you have equipped. Honestly, the game never really expounded on stats too much and I never had any problems in the game without ever really trying to understand it too much. I realize this can be both a good and bad thing, but take it as you will. Making your build in the game consists of choosing the right weapon, class, armor piece, and passive skills to optimize your movesets and active skills. Now you may have noticed, but I haven't touched on the character creation yet. That's because 1. I never really take too long in character creation in games, and 2. The camera perspective only really allows you to see your character's backside for 99.9% .9 of the game, and the remaining portion of it, your character has a face mask on, so the eyes and hair are the only things that really matter here. Combat is what you expect from a Souls-like. Light and heavy attacks, a stamina bar, dodge rolls with iframes, mana in the form of Icor, and parries. The animations are a bit on the stiff side, so fighting may feel a bit janky at some times, especially when fighting multiple enemies. Nothing innovative with the combat here, but what the game does have is a focused state. When filled, your stamina fully recovers and you're less likely to be staggered when hit for the duration. This promotes and rewards aggressive play, which is a good thing since shields aren't present in the game. Another thing unique to Code Vein is its companion system. While in Souls games you are allowed companions for boss fights or difficult sections of the game, Code Vein allows you to always bring one companion with you. This makes the early game ridiculously much easier. A bit too much than I like. You can opt to not bring a companion to get the more traditional Souls-like experience, but in my experience, it's not worth the extra effort of going through with the stiff combat alone. When defeating enemies, you gain experience called Haze, which act as souls in Souls games or runes in Elden Ring. Naturally, dying will make you drop all your Haze where you died, but the game allows you to regain half of what you lost in the hot spring in the player hub introduced in the first few hours of the game. Not a game changer, but it was nice to have the option to do so. You spend haze in the game's version of bonfires called Missile to level up, but you don't get to allocate these levels into stats. Instead, when you level up, 
the game increases the stats for you in a system that's more reminiscent of JRPGs. This is a 50-50 for me, but the game isn't Dark Souls anyway, and I didn't have any qualms with it throughout my playthrough, so it's all good. Something you'll probably notice while exploring is that you have a minimap on the top right of your screen. At first, it's all dark, but as you find Missile, parts of the map become visible. In the menu screen, you get a larger version of the map if you need it, and it shows you the percentage of the area that is mapped out. Take note that the percentage is tied to the number of missile you have purified in the map, meaning it could say 100%, but you haven't explored every nook and cranny yet. It also shows the places where you've been on the map via dots that trail the player icon. Smaller dots represent places you've been to a while back, while larger dots represent places where you've been more recently. The map system has its pros and cons. It's good in a sense that it makes backtracking easier, but it also doesn't account for the verticality of some areas, so it can get really confusing sometimes. While we're on the topic of maps, let me just say that the game's level design is horrible. It's basically claustrophobic corridors and tons of corners with barely any open areas. It's like this until the end of the game. It really gets frustrating when the levels just seem like reskins of the same map design. At the later stages of the game, the maps get more interesting, but just because they have a few gimmicks to make the fights a bit more challenging, Nothing exemplifies this more than one map in the game. The Cathedral of Sacred Blood. Oh my freaking god, this map almost made me quit. First, it's so unique in design compared to all the other maps before it that it doesn't really make sense that it's there. Though it is explained in the story in some way why it looks like that. It's basically an Orlando, but severely watered down to the point where it looks so dull. Combine that with the same trash level design and you're in for a few hours of frustration. No map in the game up to this point is as huge as this and this one has a verticality in it so the map is a bit harder to use. Everything looks so similar that it's almost impossible to check for landmarks when first mapping this out and having to backtrack in this specific map just feels like a punishment. I had to look up a guide to get through this part and once I got through it I never looked back. I didn't even bother to 100% it. Only map that I didn't by the way. If there's a part where players might quit this game, it's here. There's also an underground lake area where it's just way too like far and keep in Dark Souls 3, but it wasn't too bad of an experience so let's just leave it at that. The maps are divided by long corridors that are used as loading screens, which is made evident by the game severely lagging when transitioning from one area to another. This is the only time I found the game to stutter and the game never crashed so it wasn't that bad. Now enough of the map and level design, let's talk enemies. After you've seen the enemies the game throws at you at the first 5 hours of the game, you've mostly seen it all. The rest are just reskins with the same movesets, more health, and they just deal more damage. The only time where the game throws real enemy diversity is with the bosses. The early game bosses just feel like mini bosses, but later in the game, the bosses get way more interesting, so I'll give it that. Unfortunately, the stiff combat animations extend to the bosses as well, which makes their moves either very hard to tell or very predictable. On a final note for the gameplay, at some points in the game you'll come across invasions where you'll be swarmed by enemy NPCs in wave-like fashion. In the end, you are rewarded with an item, and this usually triggers when near a key item like a vestige. It can get frustrating at times, but what made it bad for me was when I realized that this was this game's way of being difficult. It was quantity over quality. In Souls games, I didn't mind dying because it means I did something wrong or I need to learn the movesets and be more patient. Here, it was just sheer numbers. When I died during these encounters, it felt like I lost to a gimmick and the stiff combat of the game rather than it being a skill issue. Of course, it gets easier when you get stronger and once you get the hang of the game, but I just thought it was a good thing to point this out. And that's about it for the gameplay section, moving on to the next part, replayability. I finished the game 29 hours in and I am NOT interested in going through it again in NG+. Equal parts because the game's story was the best thing going for it and because I didn't want to go through Cathedral of Sacred Blood again. Yes, it's that bad. 
I'm aware that this game has multiple endings, but I didn't bother trying to find them even if there were still unanswered questions after finally finishing the game. When visiting the hub after beating the last boss, you gain access to the Tower of Trials, which is a boss run-like encounter where you try to get to the deepest level possible without dying. I personally think the difficulty of the towers isn't worth it since all the enemies can 2-3 to three shot you even at the level I was, which was 155 by the way. But if you're looking for a greater challenge after beating the game, the option is there for you. It's also worth noting that all places can be revisited even after beating the last boss before you decide to venture into NG+, which is a good thing. With the amount of skills, weapons, blood veils, and blood codes that the game has to offer, there's a lot that you can experiment with to create unique builds or playstyles. While the story won't change in NG+, you can try discovering the other endings while going through it with a different build, which would definitely change your experience playing the game. It's also worth noting that as you progress the game, certain NPCs will appear in maps that you've cleared who will offer a few side quests with rewards. I never gave this too much thought during my run, but there were a few NPCs that could have been tied to an ending, so you could try doing these as well. All in all, I'd say you could get a good 50 hours of playtime trying to discover everything Code Vein has to offer. Now finally, with all the good and the bad we've mentioned about this game, is Code Vein worth playing in 2023? Personally, I really can't recommend this game. Consider it if it's on sale, but I didn't really have as much fun with the game as I thought I would. The stiff combat and the bad map design were barely saved by the storytelling and anime aesthetics. The companion system was a miss for me, but I can see how for others it could be a great addition to Souls-like gameplay. There's a good variety of weapons, blood veils, and blood codes for build crafting, but the poor enemy diversity leaves much to be desired. The best part about the game is its story and its cutscenes. If you like watching anime, you'll feel right at home with how the story progresses and how the characters are built up in this game. So now we've reached the end of the video. Do you agree with my verdict or do you disagree? And why? Is there anything you want to add or discuss with the community? Put it in the comment section below and let's talk about it. Thanks for watching the video. Give it a like and consider subscribing. It helps me out a lot. I'll be reviewing more games in the future, so if you like this one, you surely wouldn't want to miss those. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the next one. Have a great day ahead.